Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. I'm Derek Sparks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Yo, bosses, we are back. Episode 299, one shy of the mega milestone 300. This is Sam. I'm sitting here cozy in Barcelona with a glass of Verdejo, classic white grape from Spain. And I got my brother, Derek, sitting in San Diego. I just talked to my sister <laughs> in Los Angeles. A little north How you doing, of San Derek? Diego. I was going to ask yeah, you yeah. what you were drinking, Sam, because... It looks like something that you normally wouldn't drink. You seem like a red guy, but you pulled out the white. Mm. You know, my, my parents are in town, so we've just beat the the red wines to death over the last week. So I'm just mixing it up a little bit. Something a little fruity and floral to bring in the, the end of uh, spring and early summer over here. Very nice. And we're actually recording this on Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all the iLab people. Uh, this will be out a few days later. Yes. But this is an episode I want to jump into because I know it affects me financially. And as far as I know, it's going to affect you financially, <laughs> Sam, as well, because I think you're still holding this stock. We're going to talk about Matterport. Well, not only Matterport, what I'm more excited about than Matterport, we're going to talk about merger arbitrage, which is something that is probably not on everybody's mind, but it's actually a big investment opportunity. And there's some people that basically do this more or less full time. There's always acquisition deals going on. And as we'll find out in this episode, well, there's ways to make some some quick returns. Um, lots to consider, which I know we'll talk about. But in this episode, as Derek said, we're going to zoom in on a specific deal, which is currently a merger opportunity or a merger op arbitrage opportunity, and that's Matterport. And Matterport, for anyone who is not familiar with it or may have forgotten it, they got super hyped during the metaverse craze, once valued at $20 billion. Now, that might not sound like a lot in the, the mega cap era that we're in now, but that's a staggering 200 x revenue companies just don't get valued at 200x revenue anymore but since then they've fallen all the way from 30 dollars a share down to four where they're sitting now and have recently become an acquisition target of a company costar what do you think derek or or, or actually rather should we share a little bit about what who Matterport is before the interview. Yes. And one thing I want to bring up really quick before we do that, you brought up a good point that no matter how this Matterport deal shakes out for us, I think it's really important that we learn a new skill or I learned a new skill at least is this, you know, merger arbitrage and digging deep into this. It kind of forced me to to go further into this subject. So I'm really excited to see what happens. Yeah. Even if it's not like a huge win, I think there's potential for other opportunities down the line. So Matterport, I think almost everyone that listens to this podcast has probably seen a Matterport, even if you don't realize it. Most people are at some point or another finding themselves on a Zillow or an apartments.com. Maybe you're looking for a new place or maybe you're just like, what is that enormous house on the other side of town? Mm -hmm. It's got to be $20 million. I want to see what that thing looks like. Well, chances are that there's some kind of real estate listing out there and on a higher end house, especially it has a Matterport. So a Matterport uses this technology called a digital twin. It's like a 3D camera system and it'll literally map every square inch of an interior of a structure. So, you know, we have Google Maps and all the satellite services and everything that have essentially mapped the entire world now on the outside. But up until the last 10 years, we haven't had anything that's mapped the inside of the world. So that's where Matterport jumps in. Yeah, and it got really, really hyped during the metaverse craze because this is the kind of the best real world implementation or example of the metaverse digital copy of the real world. So you could kind of conceive of the idea that, wow, if this if a company could basically create digitized copies of all the real estate on earth, you could create, you know, a metaverse of earth. Now, a lot of the metaverses are creating like these fictional worlds that have no basis for anything that's real or tangible that we can relate to. But Matterport, in a sense, is digitally mapping all 
real estate. Right now, they more or less have a monopoly. They've had definitely early adopter advantage, but it's, you know, for, for a few years, they've really just owned the, the industry. It's pretty easy to see what they do in terms of like apartment viewings and things like this, but actually a digital copy of a of commercial real estate is much, much more useful and much more valuable than just a simple walkthrough tour. So you can think of property management, utilities management, floor plan design, booking and leasing service requests. So some of these big companies that are in property management like JOL and CBRE, they're using these digital twins to actually manage the property and all the service providers and utilities. Uh, they're able to, to send service requests and map out utility upgrades and stuff through the digital twins instead of having to give people walkthroughs and keys to the place to check it out. So it's a very, very useful in commercial real estate. It's also useful in residential real estate, as Derek was pointing out. Yeah, we'll talk more about it in this episode, how the business is doing and what the, the opportunity is in merger arbitrage. And we're also going to touch on why this is such an appealing target for CoStar Group, because CoStar Group, if you talk to anyone on the street and you ask who's CoStar Group, I don't think anyone's going to know the answer to that. Yeah. But when you find out that the brands that CoStar Group actually holds, it's going to make a lot more sense. So I came across this article by Colin Brentmeyer on The Motley Fool. I'm going to post a link to that article in the show notes so you can check that out. And it was a subject that I actually brought up on our Patreon shortly after the Matterport mm -hmm. uh, news back in April. I was like, why is this deal that was set for uh, $5.50 a share? It's going to get a little bit more complicated than that. And we'll go into that in the interview. But essentially $5.50 a share. The stock had seen a high at the announcement up to $4.99. So it got up to about 90% of the deal, which was pretty good. And as I'm going to talk about later, I set up a limit order that day to sell it at $5 a share <laughs> and it only hit $4.99. It just couldn't hit that five. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> and it got close to that. And ever since it's been dropping, we're about two months since the announcement. And actually on the Friday before we record this, Sam, it hit under $4 a share. So I'm like, why is this dropping so much? You know, four to 550 is over a 30% drop. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that with Colin and why that's happening and why this might be a good idea for you bosses to jump in here. I'm currently sitting on 52% loss on my Matterport stock. My average cost base is eight dollars and 46 cents derek i think you're doing a little bit better than me but you're still in the red right i am but i'm a little less in the red because i have a little news to announce after the oh, interview oh <laughs> boy well I'm, i know we all both have a lot a lot to say in the outro so <laughs> let's unload it there <laughs> let's talk to colin first we'll break down the deal and then sam and i will circle back afterwards hey bosses we're gonna take a quick break to hear from our sponsors the show will be right back ryan reynolds here from mint mobile with the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. With supply chains becoming more complex, you need to stay on top of the latest logistics developments. So if you work with logistics, you need the Beyond the Box podcast from Maersk. It's the easy way to keep up to date with everything from digital disruption and logistics to the need for supply chain resilience in today's market. Find out more and keep ahead of the game with the Beyond the Box podcast on logistics insights at maersk.com slash insights. Colin, thank you so much for coming on Invest Like a Boss. Thank you for having me. So we have Colin Brantmeyer. He wrote this interesting article that I came across on the recent Matterport acquisition. And I was like, why is no one else talking about this? I actually, I posted something in our uh, on our Patreon account. And I think I said this maybe like two weeks after the uh, acquisition was announced, which was, I believe, in mid-April. I said, why does this stock continue to drop? It looks like this deal should go through. This has to be a play. Why am I not just scooping up as many shares as I can? Obviously, we're going to get into that. And that was kind of the, the crux of your article. But before we do that, why don't you tell me a little bit about your background, Colin, and how you got onto the topic of merger arbitrage for this article? Sure thing. Uh, I've had many passions in life, but uh, two most prominent and persisting have been writing and investing. So I became a 
writer for The Motley Fool, where you read my article uh, a few years ago. And one of the topics I cover is merger arbitrage. I find it uh, fascinating. I, I mean, if any personal investor goal should be to beat the market, right? And mm -hmm. merger arbitrage is a technique. I think that's pretty easy, not easy, but uh, a way, a tool you have to, to do it. Some investment firms have entire teams dedicated to the practice, while others liken it to picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. It's a mixed strategy, but there is one investor who has participated in it for decades, and that's Warren Buffett. I was just going to bring him up. I was going to say, Buffett is a very big fan of merger arbitrage. Very big. Uh, he's been doing it for a very long time. And the first one I participated in was Red Hat. IBM uh, acquired it uh, early, I forget what, maybe 2020 or something like that. And I looked at it and I was like, man, this is trading 15, 20% below. Why, similar to your thoughts on Matterport, why aren't people doing it? And then soon enough, one of Berkshire's 13Fs came out and said, you know, they bought a whole bunch of shares of, of Red Hat and participated in it. Is there any any indication that Berkshire might have some interest in picking up Matterport in the same manner? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mainly, it's not going to move the needle, right? It's sure. Berkshire is a huge company. They have $180 billion in cash, I believe, cash equivalents, mostly in treasury bonds. And in Matterport's market cap is uh, $1.3 So, you know, that's... They're not going to be able to do it. Buffett also prefers all cash deals. He participated in the merger, merger arbitrage with Activision Blizzard most recently mm -hmm. and um, Monsanto when, when Bayer bought them out. And all those are cash deals and giant companies. So there's, he won't participate in it, but you know, it doesn't mean uh, smaller retail investors can't benefit. Sure. So we're going to get into the complexity of the deal because it's not as clear cut as a straight up cash buyout. So why don't we talk about who is actually trying to buy Matterport? First of all, can you tell us a little bit about COSAR Group and who they are? Because I think they own a lot of businesses that people are familiar with, but they don't know the holding company. If you if you said to anybody on the street, who's CoStar Group? I don't think anyone would have the answer to that. Yeah, they're the parent company of Apartments.com and Homes.com. You might have seen their Super Bowl ad. They've been pouring money into advertising. I can Jeff show Goldblum that. is everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> He's yeah, the Apartments.com exactly. guy. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting time that they're pouring money into advertising too, considering, you know, elevated interest rates and fewer home sales, but they're, they're doing it. They have cash to do the deal. And we can get into later on whether or not the long, the long-term prospects of that company as well, but so I know there's been kind of some controversy around CoStar too, like trying to get rid of all their competitors. Now, I mean, they've pretty much come full circle in real estate. You know, they have apartments.com, as we just mentioned, but they also have LoopNet, which is basically the biggest commercial uh, real estate listing service. And in 2021, they purchased homes.com, which is like a Zillow Redfin type site to actually purchase, you know, single family homes, condos, things of that nature. I found it interesting that I've actually just kind of, I think since this merger was announced, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I'm not sure if you do as well, but I've noticed that I've heard a ton of ads, speaking of the advertising push for homes.com. I didn't even really think of homes.com as a, as a site to visit. And then when I heard about this acquisition, I was like, oh, this totally makes sense that it's the same company that does apartments.com because the ads are very similar too. And it seems like they're trying to push their focus on a homes.com now too. And it's very interesting timing that they just picked that up two years ago. And obviously now they want Matterport too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we can get into it, but they have been selling a lot of their stock and diluting shares in order to raise money to, to fund these acquisitions. They're going all steam ahead uh, in the environment we are right now. I actually found some data where I think that this acquisition of Matterport makes a lot of sense for CoStar. When they when they did the press release on the deal, Matterport had said that, you know, they They've captured over 12 million properties in 177 countries and 38 billion square feet with their digital twin technology. Now, for people that aren't familiar with this, the digital twin is that if you go to a, a apartments.com, let's say, and you, and you want to check out a place, 
you get that virtual tour where it feels like you're 360, you're actually inside the apartment. They're actually really neat. And I've I've seen a lot of them myself. It says that CoStar itself actually owns 300,000 Matterport Digital Twins, and they were one of the first to use this technology. So obviously, they're very familiar with the company. In March of this year alone, Apartments.com had 7.4 million Matterport tour views. And this was very interesting data and why I think CoStar finds the value in Matterport. They said that a listing on apartments.com generates 10 times the leads as one without a Matterport. So if the listing has a Matterport, they average 74 leads per listing and one without a Matterport, they only got seven. I mean, that's crazy to get 10 times the lead off Matterport property. And I also found this interesting too. They, they've surveyed their viewers and they said about 55% of people said they would lease a place without ever looking at it in person. Now, I don't think I'm at that level, but um, I want to see where I'm going to live. But it, it seems that people are getting more comfortable with actually taking a big purchase like a property or a rental without ever stepping foot in it. Yeah, absolutely. It's the way the the future, uh, future is now and more and more people are doing it. I think Zillow has a competing technology and maybe Redfin as well. I'm not 100% sure because I, I thought they used Matterports, but there, there could be other technology out there now. I know for a while Matterport was the only one in the game, but I'm sure there's other people that have popped up now too. Right. What do you think of the pricing of this? We should probably get into the deal. Yeah. So I think this this seems like a, a perfect fit for CoStar, but maybe they're paying too much because Matterport stock, as I'm familiar with, is completely crushed. It was down in, in the twos for a long time and they're offering up to 550 a share now. It's not not as plain as simple as 550 in cash, but we can break it down to that deal. And what do you think of this pricing? Yeah, so Matterport came onto the market as a SPAC at $10 a share, shot up to $30, give or take, and then cratered, yet to around $2. And then when the announcements came, it was up 200% and uh, is now trading around $4. So the deal is for every share of Matterport, the shareholder will receive $2.75 in cash. Which is already higher than the, the stock price was when they announced the acquisition. So had you Correct. purchased the day before, you'd be in the money already. Absolutely. And then the second part of the deal is you'll get roughly $2.75 worth of CoStar stock. This is where I was a little confused because it seemed pretty clear cut. It'd be two seventy five cash, two seventy five in stock. Yes. And then I found out there's a little stipulation to that. So do you want to get into that a little bit? Yeah, it is not clear cut at all. And I think this is part of the reason why Matterport is trading at such a discount. So if CoStar's average share price will be established using a volume weighted price of the 20 the previous 20 consecutive days of trading, three days prior to that acquisition. So essentially, they're going to take the average of CoStar's share price. And if it falls between $77.43 and $94.61, Matterport shareholders will receive $2.75 divided by the average share price. So let's just break that down really quick too. These are the 20 days before the deal actually closes, correct? Yeah. So Three days before the deal closes, the 20 days, the average price of those 20 days, essentially. <laughs> just just to complicate it <laughs> a little bit more. So yeah, as long as it falls, let's say, let's just say for easier numbers, because I'm sure people are running numbers through their head um, yeah, yeah. in that time period beforehand, basically between $74 and $94, if the share price lands in there, you'll get $2.75 per share. But there's a problem because I'm looking at CoStar Group right now and they're down quite a bit. Yes. So if CoStar's stock is $77.42 or less, then there's a number, an exchange ratio of 0 0.03552. So currently, I last time I looked, it was CoStar was $76.40. And that equates to about $2.41. Back of the envelope math is is correct there. So if that's the average, hypothetically, you're already getting less than that 550 you think you might get. I guess uh, we'd have to get like an average price of under like 75 even or so to get back to that 275 number, huh? I'm trying to think of rough math in my head. <laughs> yeah, if it's, you know, if it goes down to like 60, you're, you're only going to get, I think it's like 218. Oh, I'm I'm going backwards. Okay, so yeah. yeah. So if the stock's lower, we're actually getting less. I felt like we were getting more because you're right. Because if, if the number's above 94, which highly doubt it will be, 
um, you do get less percentage of shares, but since the stock price is so much higher, it's actually balancing out. Okay. Per correct. You still I was doing a, it backwards in my head. <laughs> you still have a sizable spread, even if CoStar stock goes pretty far below. It's I think it's 52-week low is 67. So even if it goes down to 60, you get a sizable amount even worst case scenario i think i think there's a lot to like here so but then, basically we're, we're rooting for the stock to be above 77.43 as the average price because that seems like the best deal for investors here yeah or below that and then some in that three-day waiting period it, it spikes up that would be nice but sure <laughs> <laughs> See, that'd, be, that. that'd be best case you could get more than <laughs> get more than uh 275 worth so here's my question i kind of had a similar to deal to this a year or two ago that i feel like i got burnt on a little bit i don't know if you remember the, the at&t time warner and the discovery stock split where they kind of broke up into two companies i feel like i really got burned on that deal because discovery stock was just garbage <laughs> oh warner brothers yeah, discovery <laughs> Right. I and I similarly I got burned on I didn't have a huge position, but uh the Spirit Airline mm -hmm. one with JetBlue bought it out and they were they kept offering, you know, it was like two you get two dollars and fifty cents as soon as the shareholders approve of it, and then ten cents every month and, and then it just got um no, it never went through shot down. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I think the lesson here is you gotta love the underlying company through good or bad. If you love Matterport, you sh you're okay with it not going through, right? So I think if, if you want to invest in a merger arbitrage, you should love the company getting bought out. So what if you don't love the company buying it? So let's say I hold on to this deal until it goes through. Day one, can I sell all my CoStar stock? Is there anything preventing me from doing that? There's nothing preventing you from doing that. I am personally leaning towards that case. Just looking at, mm -hmm. at CoStar's numbers and um, we can get into both financial statements of each a little bit, but Matterport seems like the much more interesting company in stock to me at this time. So if you want to get into the tax implications, we can, we can do that as well. Yeah. Let's talk about that because I'm wondering how this works, especially from a personal standpoint. I think the majority of my shares are over a year now in Matterport. I yes. do have some short-term shares too, I believe. So how will this be taxed? Will the federal government look at this as a sale of 275 of your Matterport shares and then a brand new purchase of 275, well, supposedly 275 of CoStar? Or is this could be a strange tax event for people, I think. Yes. And uh, of course, it has to be more complicated than it should be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, backing out. First, there's long-term capital gains, uh, which, as you alluded to, you have to own the stock for more than a year. And then there's short-term capital gains. I think most people fall into the 15% tax bracket for long-term capital gains and the mm -hmm. 22 to 24% tax bracket for short-term. So using the current prices of Matterport and CoStar stock, the spread I calculated right now is 34%, which is pretty... Mm -hmm. Pretty great. If you are a long-term shareholder, that becomes 29%. This is assuming you you get your 275 in cash and sell CoStar stock, I should say. Okay. And then short term, it's it's about 26, 27% spread. Okay, it's great. So that's so not keep that keep that in mind. I mean, if your goal is to beat the S P five hundred, which historically returns 10% annualized, you're crushing it, right? I, I would never suggest or give the opinion that you should allocate a huge portion of your portfolio to merger arbitrage, but even just a few percentage points can help you beat the market. Yeah, I don't I don't think we're I don't think we're telling anybody this is a grand slam, but yeah. it could be a nice double. So, so yeah, anyway, <laughs> with that background, let's get into the the weeds of the tax implications if you want to hold on to CoStar. Yeah, let's do that. Well, before we do that really quick, the cash portion, is that just considered a sale of Matterport? You sold the, you sold your stock for 275. So let's say my average buy price, which I think mine was, was around $4 per share. If the government looks at me as selling my Matterport for 275, am I technically getting a, a long-term loss or short-term loss out of that? So the gain or loss is recognized in lieu of a fractional share for the cash position. So you bought it at what price? I think I'm around four dollars a share. Okay, so I I think you in that case it would be two dollars of that would be gotcha. So they consider it as half of, yeah, of your half. shares. Okay, so you'd be taxed. 
I'm not a tax uh, professional, by the way. No, as so, you're pointing but, out, they, they make yes. it more complicated <laughs> than they should. <laughs> yeah. So you'll be taxed on the cash. So th- this is the the other part of the the deal. Ideally, CoStar they have they have to submit to the IRS the intended tax treatment they call it. So they they want it so that if you hold on to your CoStar shares, you will not be taxed. However, the IRS rules on this and you won't know the ruling no later than 45 days after the time of the merger. So there is a scenario where you will be taxed on the cash and the shares you receive, even if you don't sell your CoStar stock. And we won't know that until after the merger goes through. Yes. Well, isn't that convenient? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. But in my case, if I'm looking at this, me personally, I don't think I'm that interested in CoStar at the moment. So I would probably, this is just me again, not giving anyone advice, sell and just not have to deal with that. So I think either way, you got to think of it that you're going to get taxed on both anyways, because you're probably just going to sell your CoStar as soon as yeah. you get it. Okay. Can we talk about some possible hurdles for this not to happen? You had mentioned, you know, the JetBlue spirit thing. I know the federal government loves to block airline mergers, so I don't think that one was super surprising. I don't see any reason here to block this one. I mean, we're talking about you know real estate listings. I don't know, but maybe. I don't know. Is there anything you see right. out there that there's a problem? There was a similar transaction. Amazon was trying to buy iRobot, and iRobot, I think, for around a billion dollars. And the the Justice Department nixed that. Could that be picking on big tech, though? I mean, yeah. Amazon is, is a good enemy to go after. Yeah, absolutely. Um, after that, the head of the Justice Department said in, in regard to halting the iRobot one, we took these actions to address the trends toward concentration of industry and put a stop to anti-competitive behavior before it takes hold. And there is precedent for CoStar for going after competitors. So maybe there is something there. Maybe, but again, I think it, it has a lot of competition that we've alluded to with Redfin, Zillow, other, I think it would be hard pressed to stop it based solely on antitrust concerns. You never know which way. I mean, definitely this Department of Justice hasn't been as friendly to acquisitions and mergers. There's no doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, and, and I think that's why we've seen a lot less in the last couple of years or so. Now, one other potential problem, which I don't think this is a problem either, and based on your article, I don't think you said it would be either, is getting shareholder approval. So when this was announced, it actually said that everyone on the board you know, already approved this deal, and that's about 15% of shareholders alone already. So do you see any reason why this wouldn't pass through shareholders of Matterport? Yeah, so 15%... Of, of management has already approved the, they just announced when the vote is going to be. I think it was. Oh, I missed that. Okay. July 26 will be the shareholder vote for Matterport. I, again, if you were the shareholder that bought at 30 and held on through all the way to $2, you're probably not thrilled that <laughs> <Yeah>. it's... <laughs> I think that's where my get. co-host Sam is. I, I don't think I don't think he's in the money. I think maybe break even at best, but yeah. <laughs> right, right. You're probably not thrilled 550 is the best you're gonna get. So I, I don't think it's you know, it's not gonna be a unanimous approval. With that said, yeah, your 15% is on its way to 51%. Let me ask you a question from one of our listeners. Uh, Mark from Patreon asks, he says, I own Matterport stock, so I'm very interested in hearing about this. The stock price has been trending down since the announcement suggesting the market fears this deal will not go ahead. However, your article implies that Matterport is a good buy because the market is underestimating how likely this will go through. So why do you think the market is wrong or inefficient in this case? Yeah, with any merger arbitrage, there's generally just bad news until there's good news, right? It's it's not for the faint of heart for investing in merger arbitrage. I mean, usually, I mean, Warren Buffett wavered with Activision Blizzard. I don't know. That was a two-year, nearly two-year ordeal. And he started selling off his shares before it went through. So I think, I think people get antsy. Uh, and there's been a couple of recent news items that aren't necessarily in its favor. We can go through those. So two weeks ago, a court ruled that former Matterport CEO, William Brown, 
is entitled to recoup $79 million from the company he once led. Matterport said that it anticipates appealing, appealing the ruling. So if you're co-star and you just bought a company. You might be on the hook for an $80 million bill. Yeah, all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden you're on the hook for that. You might not be too happy. Do you know the reasoning why he, the court said he was... Yeah, it had something to do with his going public and his vesting options and, okay. and all that. But I think he originally wanted more, like $114 million and and the judge ruled $79 million was sufficient, but... Pretty good deal for a company that's not even profitable. Uh, <laughs> so. Sure. And then the other, there's another lawsuit. A Matterport shareholder filed a complaint saying CoStar's S4 registration statement was materially misleading and omits certain material information relating to the sales process, financial projections, matter. Port and CoStar. I think that's pretty common fare in these though, right? A yeah, class so action that, suit that is going to come. Right. And Matterport believes the demands are without merit and intends to defend against them. But again, these are all, you know, these all hit the news. They all, people see them, they get nervous. Some, sometimes in the case of iRobot, Amazon, Amazon amended what their initial price, I think it was initially was going to pay like $61 for iRobot. And then they they went, they said, no, we're not going to pay that because iRobot had to take out a loan to fund operations. Okay. So then it went down to $51 or something. So, I mean, companies can amend it. So that $550 is not set in stone. It can't be amended after a vote though, can it? I mean, it, it if... can. And then, okay. and then there will have to be another vote. Okay. I was going to say, I was like, if I, if I agree to a 550 and then they, oh, just kidding now. So, no, okay. Right. Right. Okay. No. Would but have to be another vote. It would then. be an amended shareholder vote. I'm kind of frustrated. The stock's been falling too. So the the morning of the, of the announcement, I actually set a limit order to sell it at five dollars. I was like, hey, five is ninety percent mm. of the deal. That that's a good deal, right? Well, the stock hit four ninety nine that day. It never hit five. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm kind of frustrated right now. Sure. Um, but is is the structure of this half cash, half stock really scaring people away? If you saw this as an all cash deal, would you would we see the stock higher right now? Yeah, I think it would be closer to about 10% spread, 10, 15%. But yeah, it's, I mean, as we've seen that, that 275 and CoStar is already looking like it could be 270, 271. Who knows if it falls further. And if we're seeing a vote in July, is that a sign that we're pretty close to a deal? We're recording this in mid-June here. So we're about a month away from that. Is, th is that maybe a good sign that this deal will close within the next month or two? It is a good sign. So initially management said they expect the deal to go through within by the end of the calendar year, 2024. Mm -hmm. The termination date of this deal is, I think it's like January 25th or something. And that can be of 2025. And that can be extended three separate times for 90 days. I don't. I think that's unlikely. Con considering the deal only needs to be approved in the US and the UK. So that's something in the favor. Activision okay. Blizzard for comparison was like 30 or 40 different regulatory bodies all over the world. So that's good. And then, yeah, so the U.S. regulatory body is supposed to respond by July 3rd. And at that time, they will either ask for more information on the deal, file suit to block it, negotiate a settlement. Uh, think of, so when Activision Blizzard, they, uh, Microsoft was something with Call of Duty they were concerned about. They wanted Call of Duty, the game, to be available on other platforms and not just Xbox. So just that was part of the settlement. Best case scenario, no problem. Screen flags allow the transaction to close. If that happens on July 3rd, and then the votes on July 26th, and that gets approved, I think you're looking at a pretty close, clo a pretty short closing. Uh, the UK would still need to approve of it. But yeah, it shouldn't it shouldn't be until January. Two dates to really look forward to July 3rd, Justice Department rules and July 26th would be that vote. And then if all those pass, we should be looking at a pretty quick wrap up after that. Yeah, I think you'll see the stock move sharply either way um, after those events. Two really important hurdles there. Let's yeah. say worst case scenario, this deal falls apart, never happens. What does CoStar have to do to pay for that inconvenience? Sure. They have to pay a breakup fee or termination fee, they call it, of $85 million. So currently... Matter so they can ports. pay the CEO off. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, isn't that convenient? At least, at least Matterport will have uh, money to do that. <laughs> 
But yeah, so currently Matterport has a very nice balance sheet. They have $419 million in cash and short-term and long-term investments, which is great. No debt. You don't have to worry about uh, high interest rates right now. And Yeah, I noticed that too. And I, I was like, you know what? If this doesn't go through, an $85 million, uh, influx in cash would be great. And I would think that maybe that would be enough to keep the stock propped up around the current prices. And it wouldn't be so bad if this deal did fall apart. Absolutely. And actually, um, Matterport released its projections for the next decade, which is nice. They generated $158 million in revenue for 2023, for reference. Their initial 2024 guidance was when they came out with uh, their Q4 earnings was $173 million to $183 million for 2024. They just came out that they expect $190 million in revenue. At the top end the, of that for this year, so it's yeah, it's above above the range, which is great. Uh, they don't expect to be free cash flow positive, however, until 2026 when they expect 11 million. So, but but in 2024, they only expect to be negative free cash flow of 33 million in 2025. Uh, negative 8 million. So, it, And if they're sitting on over 400 with no debt, right. I mean, there's no chance that they're going to run out of cash anytime soon. So exactly. I think the company's in a good space already. Exactly. So a lot to like. And then they, in, 20, in 2033, they expect to have 1.3 billion in revenue and 309 million in free cash flow for whatever that's worth. But there's a lot to like. And then they some other tidbits of information I found as of the end of Q1, 26% of Fortune 1000 companies use Matterport to manage their enterprise facilities, real estate portfolios, factories, offices, and retail locations. And that's up from 25% the year before. So I think there's basically unlimited possibilities with Matterport. The technology is really cool. I mean, I personally use it all the time. I'm one of those guys that's on Zillow checking out crazy houses all the time. And yeah. if it's got a Matterport, I'm like, oh, I'm going to look at that. I mean, I got to see what's in there. And, you know, just think about like Google Maps or any other mapping company, how they've mapped the entire exterior of the world. Why haven't we mapped the interior of the world, which there's so much actually more space than the exterior to actually map out and Matterport's, you know, the first one in to really do all this. So I think it's an exciting space. And if people are willing to change their moods of actually buying houses or renting apartments without ever stepping foot in them, this is, you know, your best possible option right now. Yeah, I agree. Lots of like about Matterport's uh, with or without this acquisition and, and their depressed stock price. So I got to ask you before we get out of here, do you personally own Matterport or are you maybe thinking of jumping in before this deal goes through? Yeah, I did initiate a position after I wrote that article and after digging in, in preparation for this, I, I think I expect to to buy some more um, ahead of those key dates in July. Those are good dates to know. I wish I could tell you what the stock price is right now, but the Schwab site is down and that's who I use right now. And it's been down all day. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> uh, but yesterday it was at about 4.15, which is a very nice discount. <laughs> and I checked prior to this meeting, it was at 4.07. So it's, <laughs> yeah, people are getting nervous, but there's a there's a lot to like. And again, if, if your goal is to beat the S&P 500, merger arbitrage is a great way to do that. It's been proven. I mean, the best investor of our time, arguably Warren Buffett is is a fan and- Well, I like it. I think I'm gonna pick up some more myself. I, I'm gonna discuss it more with uh, Sam here after we get off this interview and I might be convinced to pick up a few more shares. And just another topic that we haven't talked about. We're over 300 episodes now on this show and there's always other ways to make money maybe beat the market. And I think this one's very intriguing. So Colin, I really appreciate your time. Before we get out of here, why don't you tell us where people can go to learn more about you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can read my articles on The Motley Fool. And uh, I also write the novels and you can find my first novel, uh, Death of a Car Salesman, which is uh, the log line is uh, Succession Meets Knives Out. So if you're interested in a good summer reading, check it out. Nice. That sounds interesting. And I'm a car guy, so I might have to pick up that book too. <laughs> awesome. All right. So July 3rd, we're looking out for July 26th. And in the meantime, you're going to read articles from Colin. I'm going to put all the links to find him at the bottom of the show notes. Colin, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Hey, bosses. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. The show will be right back. Think of some brilliant business partners, Ben and Jerry, Procter and Gamble. How about Buffett and Munger? We bring up those guys all the time. And if you're looking for the perfect partner to grow your business, that's going to meet you and Shopify. 
Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. So whether you're selling shipping supplies or promoting productivity programs, Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. In fact, all three of us here at Invest Like a Boss have used Shopify at one point or another. Johnny actually hit me up and he said he used Shopify for his drop shipping business and made over $30,000 a month in sales. He said they're the best, easiest to use platform and it grew with his needs. So now it's time to start your Shopify story. Sign up for $1 a month when you do a trial period at shopify.com slash iLab. Make sure the iLab is all lowercase. Head to shopify.com slash iLab now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash I-L-A-B. Derek, that was, man, I learned a lot on that and I'm all over the board on what I want to do here, but this is some real casino stuff. This is like (laughs) strictly... What's what's the risk? Uh, okay, bet ten to make three and lose five. I'm trying I'm trying to figure it out, but this is this is purely like a casino game. I think this gives us a little better advantage than a casino, but that's assuming that everything goes to plan. And oh. most things I do don't go to plan, so. <laughs> <laughs> including our original investment in Matterport. Yeah, so I looked back, Sam. Hold on, do you know when we started talking about Matterport? I looked up on our episodes, the dates here. Think think uh, of the date that we first I'm, started I'm, talking about the metaverse. I'm guessing mid-21. Yeah, September of 21. Almost three years ago. Isn't that wild that we put all this money in? I mean, you put a lot more than I did, but it was a pretty significant chunk for me at the time. And now we've got three years gone by. And what do we have to show for it? <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit more concerned by just how fast time is flying yeah. versus my Matterport losses. <laughs> like That just gives me a reference. I thought this stuff was fresh, man. Three years. I was thinking, so I thought maybe two at the most. So we're, we're almost three years into this. And obviously, we haven't, we haven't seen a win on Matterport. Um, a couple of the others, you know, some of the bigger tech names, you know, have recovered since then. But it's just kind of wild how fast time goes here. And... Hmm. This stock in particular, I know you and I have brought up multiple times since it's just kind of been like, it's that one you reference every time you're like, what happened here? (laughs) So I wanted to look back on some of my purchase history. So before this deal was announced, Sam, Matterport was trading in the twos, actually even Mm. under two at a certain point. Uh, As far as like late 2023, it had dropped into the ones. So I looked up how much I had actually paid for Matterport because I have purchased Matterport. Let me count here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 10, 11, 12, almost 30 times I purchased shares of Matterport. Derek, man, you're a diehard, Talk about chasing a falling knife. (laughs) And so (laughs) this merger uh, could be a blessing in disguise. But the most I ever paid for Matterport stock was $11.69. And that was back in January of 22. So it had dropped Mm from about $12 a share all the way down to less than $2 a share. The cheapest I ever got it was for $1.93. So I had just, if I had a little bit of cash in there, maybe I had some dividends come in. I'd be like, oh, buy a few more shares of Matterport and bring the cost basis Mm -hmm. down a little bit. Because Mm -hmm. I always believed that this is a huge technology and there's not a lot of competitors out there. And Colin had did bring up some competitors that have recently come up and I looked into them last night and they're really not a threat. A lot of people are complaining that the technology is not as good and Matterports just gets better and better. A friend actually sent me a project that they want to work on uh, here in LA and it's just it's a mess of a house, but they Matterported it. And it's like, you can see every detail. They had ripped out the the sheetrock and everything. And you could see the, literally the electrical and the plumbing and all the walls. You could zoom in yeah. as close as you could. Like their technology is amazing. And it just seems like a really good fit with CoStar. Although um, I know, Sam, you've had some issues with CoStar, potentially with some of mm-hmm. your other business deals. When I looked into CoStar, they seem a little sketchy. <laughs> um, so I liked yeah. Colin's plan here of, you know, take your 275 in cash and day one, assuming the stock doesn't crater, just get rid of those CoStar shares. I mean, what are your thoughts on CoStar? So I used to be in the in this industry, I used to be in commercial real estate. Uh, God, I don't even know how it happened. Well, I started the, the company Coworker and 
built that and ran it for seven years. We got acquired by a company called IWG, who owns Regis, big competitor of, of WeWork. I know Regis. But, We got a lot you know, of them around here. Yeah. big, big and successful. WeWork's basically bankrupt at this point. And during those two years uh, under ownership of, of Regis, you know, got to know more of the com commercial real estate side of the business. Yeah, CoStar was a very, like not too many people knew about them. They didn't have a great reputation, a lot of cutthroat tactics, difficult to work with in a lot of ways. So when I saw this deal, going back actually to when I invested in Matterport, I believe so much in this kind of digital twin or or digital mapping of, of real estate that I not only made an investment in Matterport, I also made another big investment in the space. Do you know what that is, Derek? Another 3D investment into the space. I don't know. No. So it was actually a private investment and it's called Simpler Space and they're a competitor of Matterport, but they're a private company and they're a startup. At least they were a startup back three years ago when I invested in them. And my idea was, okay, I'm going to kind of take the top of the market, the kind of big dinosaur in the room, this Mm-hmm. fast moving. And, you know, when I was in the industry and we talked about this a lot on the episode, it was like, man, everywhere I turn, I'm hearing about Matterport. Like we had, Yep. Derek, you remember we had like three episodes in a row that someone just mentioned Matterport Yeah, and we were it like, kept whoa, coming whoa, up. whoa, 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 what's happening? What's happening here? And then I was matching that to... to my experience in commercial real estate where like everywhere you turned, I'm like, oh man, this, this company is going to be a monster. Right. And it was right there in the, the, be, even before the metaverse craze, we were calling the coming metaverse craze. So I thought, okay, I'll invest in Matterport at the top, sort of like the top of the, the industry. And then, like you said, there's not many competitors at all, uh, but there's one I got to know. And I thought they were doing a really killer job and had the right approach. Whereas Matterport's pricing is, you know, it's more digestible, for larger real estate, commercial real estate companies, large commercial real estate listings, but for like the small co-working spaces, for the small individual residential listings and stuff, Matterport gets pretty pricey. So I thought there's definitely room for two or maybe three of these companies that kind of take a different piece of the pie. So yeah, I made a, I made a sizable investment as large as my investment in Matterport in a private company, simpler space. So when, when this deal was announced, I became very excited for two reasons. One is because I literally thought that there's a chance that Matterport might go bankrupt. Now they have a healthy balance sheet, which you guys talked about in the episode, which is good, but something happened a few years ago where like they just started basically, I wouldn't say failing, but stalling where they couldn't grow revenues and they couldn't hit the projections that they were saying they were going to hit. It just didn't like a company that small in a industry that big with a pipeline as big as Matterport that can't grow revenues over the course of four years, something looks seriously wrong there. Stock price was falling, etc. So anyways, I got very excited about this deal because I thought, okay, Matterport might go bankrupt. So hopefully it can salvage some value out of the shares I own. But also if the deal goes through a co-star, I think a lot of their current clients will not like that idea. Because they they have the you know CoStar has got a certain reputation. They may say, "I don't, I'm not interested in continuing with services under CoStar's management or ownership." And I want to find a you know I, I like this this product, but I want to find a different service provider. So I'm hoping that that will boost uh, the sales of Simpler Space. So this could be a win win for you. I mean, it's all the more reason to to dump the CoStar stock. I think right away. And let's talk about guidance for Matterport. So you said, you know, they were never able to reach growth potential, which kind of seemed weird because you think with, you know, COVID happening, let's say 2020 to at least 2022, that was all about like, I don't want to go somewhere in person. I want to see stuff virtually. Think of like Zoom blowing up and, you know, um, Yeah. it kind of forced us to, to use Zoom and uh, a lot of other companies and things like that benefited from that. And Matterport was never really able to take full advantage of that. So Yeah. another reason Matterport kind of stock seemed to tank is it followed the the root of all these SPACs. It, it did a SPAC. Everyone was really excited about those two, three years ago. And then we've subsequently seen all these SPACs, you know, start high and dr just drop. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Matterport. You did mention that, you know, there's a potential they could go bankrupt. I don't see that happening because they're actually, while they're not growing as fast as they had projected and everyone else would want, they're not burning through cash. They're not 
irresponsible with their cash. So I think they have a, you know, a multi-year float on cash. But here's one example. We'll put this chart up too in, in the show notes. So in 2021, when they went public, they had projected 123 million in revenue. They only did 111. So it is, you know, it's about 90% of the way there, not horrible. But then it starts to get worse after that. 2022, they projected 202 million. They only did 136. And then by 2023, they projected 323 and they only did 158. So they're not even halfway to their projected revenue. And for this year, 2024, they projected 510 million. And their actual new guidance, this this one's a little bit old on here, is 190 million. So they're at like that is horrible. 35 that is so percent bad, of projections. Man. Yeah, it's pretty That's bad. Terrible. And actually, I mean, they do have a healthy balance sheet, but just as a reference, to 2023 last year, they made 157 million, but they burned 200 million. So they 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 have net loss of 200 million. So they are burning a shitload of cash for a company that size, but they do have a, a healthy balance sheet to at least sustain them for a couple more years. I just don't see that they're turning the corner, and they they should have such a massive pipeline. And like we've already identified, they have a they they've had a virtual monopoly in this space for the last three or four years. What always impressed me with Matterport is commercial real estate has a extremely long sales cycle. It is so hard to get deals done with big companies like CBRE, Regis, JOL. And for Matterport's not that old of a company. So they were able to monetize rather quickly and get, you know, get traction over the course of five, six, seven years that they've been in business commercialized. That's not easy, even if you have a monopoly in commercial real estate. So I was always impressed by that. But since then, they've just seemed to have stalled. And that gives me a lot of pause going forward with the company, as we know, there's a lot of smaller companies, a lot of smaller competition that are now kind of on their heels. And with CoStar possibly getting into this, I think a lot of the other current clients will want to switch. But also if CoStar pulls out of this, I would not want to be in Matterport, man. These type of deals, merger and acquisition processes, they distract the hell out of businesses. And all the board and management that have already agreed to do this deal, they start counting their chips. They start counting counting the money that they're going to make, even though it's you know falling uh, largely off of the the high end valuation that they once were. And man, it's it's gut wrenching when deals fall through. So they're going to lose a lot of momentum and a lot of speed if this deal falls through. Yeah, there is a lot of controversy out there that this deal looks a whole lot better for Matterport executives than it does for shareholders. <laughs> if you you know if, if you're one of those ones that bought you know in the fifteen to twenty dollar range and you're getting five fifty a share, it looks like a horrible idea. But if you just bought six months ago at $2 a share, this looks fantastic. So that's why voting is important too. And I think we've, that's kind of been the theme of 2024 for us in this podcast, (laughs) that voting on public stocks is extremely important where we've learned that almost 90% of people don't even bother to vote. But in matters like this, this is really important. So I did ask Colin and we weren't able to fully answer it, but I looked it up afterwards. I was curious whether, you know, 51% of shareholders need to approve this deal. And that's not the case. It's just a simple majority of the vote. So if we already have the board's 15% approval for this deal, we just need a simple majority on the next vote that'll be on July 26th. So assuming that Mm -hmm. over 51% of the votes that happened on July 26th, are yes, then this deal can move forward. And I think that's pretty achievable here, considering that the majority of the votes are held by institutions. So institutions, I think, are just going to want to shoot this dog in the backyard too. (laughs) Yeah. All right, Derek, you said in the beginning of this this outro that you thought the the deal looked maybe a little bit better than 50-50 odds. Or, or at least a 50 50 chance to make money. I think it's the opposite. So let's okay. Let's have a crack at that. Where how do you how do how do you dissect this? I first of all, I don't see any pushback from the feds on this. I don't see how this space is so niche that it's not what we're seeing now with these uh you know merger approvals and rejections are they're going after big tech. He brought up the Amazon deal and airlines. It's like a good headline for them. And unfortunately, everything political now. You know, it's all about getting press and media. I don't think anyone cares about Matterport, honestly, to be headline worthy. (laughs) So they're going to let this deal go through. I don't see any issues there. I think that uh, the vote is going to happen. So that we're talking the end of July. I say by Labor Day, this baby's wrapped up. We're getting 275 in cash, 275 CoStar. I'm dumping CoStar day one. 
What do you say, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That sounds pretty reasonable. Actually, that, that may have tilted my, my betting odds a little bit. But for me, I think this is a 50-50 thing of going through. There's all types of reasons unforeseen. I agree with you. I don't think this gets blocked by the Fed uh, or at least for antitrust purposes. But there's always reasons unforeseen that deals fall through. A lot of due diligence is going to go on. And also what there's a big risk is during due diligence, there's a good chance that something comes out that CoStar doesn't like. And they say, yeah, this accounting was done wrong or your pipeline's not as big as you said it was or you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's when they come back and say, we're no longer offering X, we're offering Y, right? And there's different ways that they can also get out of that 85 million that they are subject to pay if the deal falls through. Having, you know, I don't have nearly as much experience as a lot of people with merger and acquisitions, but I've been through a few of them myself and it's always down to the wire, man. Mm -hmm. It's like, sometimes they go through, sometimes they don't, but it's like, it never looks like it's, it's always, like it's clear. It's just always just constant things coming out of the woodworks, constant renegotiations, constant snags. And for me, that means this is like a 50-50 deal and we know what the upside is. It's 30%, right? Yep. Maybe a little bit more now at the, at the share price. Yeah, it's actually, it's, I think we're at like 30 to 35% now. One thing that does concern me is it's been awfully quiet. There, there's really no headlines supporting this or, or going against this. So I don't know if maybe, you know, CoStar thought or Matterport thought that there might be competing bids once the first one came out. The consensus is that, you know, maybe Kosar is overpaying here mm -hmm. and maybe that's why no one else has jumped in, but it's been awfully quiet. So I, I didn't throw all my chips in when it dropped under four. I, I thought this is this is pretty tempting. Yeah, I think Kosar will have some type of protection against a competing bid. I could be wrong, but a lot of times like that 85 million that they're subject to pay if they, if the deal falls through is probably based on the fact that they have exclusive deal to close the deal at the, at the at the said price in in some of the acquisitions i've been through before there's like a lockup period it's like hey we have six months to close or three months to close and you cannot even ex you cannot even entertain a competing offer oh okay i was i was under the impression that that they could okay you couldn't even look it, it could be different it could be different but unless there's any type of restrictions with public companies not allowing that why would you agree to pay 85 million if you don't go through with the deal if you don't have any protection to, to go through with the deal right I, i'm sure it's subject to uh if you know if a competitor ended up winning the company they shouldn't be subject to that 85 i i, I think it's only if that offer yeah. is accepted or not as a buyer you're putting a lot on the line when you make an offer and go through due diligence they're spending probably tens of millions of dollars just in the due diligence process to try to, to close this deal. You want some type of protection that as soon as the group goes to the market and says, we're going to do a, you know, we're getting acquired. You want, you know, that, that puts it on everyone's, on everyone's desk, right? Mm -hmm. You want some type of protection that, Hey, we're going to invest in this. We want some protection that the deal that we've agreed to do, assuming due diligence goes through is going to get done. And we don't have to worry about competing bids. You know, as a buyer, that's what I would I'd be doing. That's what was the case in a couple of my deals. Could be different in this deal. But back to what we're doing, Derek. Okay, I see this as a 50-50 deal, 30% upside, but we don't know what the downside is. If this deal doesn't go through, I say Matterport drops 50%. We go from four down to two and maybe lower. And maybe if you hold on to stock, it goes higher. But so it's 50-50 deal. You make 30% on the upside, 50% on downside. I don't take those odds, man. That's that's gambling and the house is going to win. I agree with you that, you know, this deal doesn't go through a Matterport stock is going to is going to drop. Let's hope that they would get the 85 million. That's a 20 percent infusion in cash. So maybe that would provide a little buffer yeah. to the market to yeah. give us some sympathy. It did drop under four on Friday and it was just too tempting for me to say no. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. So what'd you do? Uh, I did buy I did buy some more on Friday. I bought a couple hundred more shares and it did it dropped my price down. I thought I was closer to four dollars a share at my uh average buy price, but I was at like four seventy. So now my average buy price is four forty nine. So, wow, you're gonna make money on this yeah, if it goes through. Potentially. So let's say everything goes great and it goes through. Um I should I should be making money here. But I also going to keep an eye out on these these particular dates. So July 3rd, we'll, we'll have the decision from the feds. If that goes through, I think that bumps the stock a little bit. It's going to kind of come back to life. And then July 26th, if the votes go through, then that's going to bump the stock too. So if we get closer to that five or I'm in the money, I might just get out of this just, just to be out of it.
Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm kind of holding the grudge that I want my money back, but that could come back to burn me too. <laughs> <laughs> one other small detail I was thinking about during your, your interview. One thing I don't like about this is I feel like there's so much insider trading on a deal like this. There's just how many employees does Matterport have? And half of them are probably le leaking information to their friends and other people they know their stockholders. Like, hey man, it looks like the deal is going to go through. You know, I've right? always like, thought everyone, that. Everyone's got information except us, basically. So when I see that the price continuing to shed, I'm like, I don't think those are investors like you and me that are that are selling off. I think it's people in the know that are like, hey man, this doesn't look good or whatever. So that's why I would personally stay out of merger arbitrage unless to uh the point of this interview which i thought was great was like you shouldn't get involved in this unless you love the underlying company because if the deal falls through you should love it and hold it you know if the deal goes through and you're happy with it great and for me i don't love matterport i've lost a lot on it i don't want to you know try to grab a falling knife and uh anymore because i've been doing yeah. that and I'm out. You bring up a good point because there's there is something we should mention that could be of concern. On June 4th of this year, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, the CEO, uh, Raymond Pittman, actually sold $1.5 in stock. Now, when executives sell uh, stock, it has to uh, be publicly notified. And that's something to be concerned about. Obviously, he holds a lot more than a million and a half. Maybe he wanted to buy a couple of nice cars and he wants some cash now, but why would you be selling over a million in stock when you think you have this home run deal going through? Maybe he knows there's a dirty diaper that's about to be found yeah, in the trash. So that's, that's a concern <laughs> that bumps my confidence level down a couple of points. I'm still over 50%, Sam. I, th I, th you know what? Think of it this way. Six months ago, if Matterport stock was at $4, would you have bought some more? No. <laughs> I stopped buying a long time ago, man. Once once I saw, I watched a, a YouTube video that just reviewed it, Matterport because I was I was a pretty diehard believer in this. And uh, I just think something happened where they've, they, they're, they're not executing at, at the top at the top level anymore. And I was going to say that the, te the technology is amazing and I still think it, it has so much potential, but their execution strategy has been just garbage. Yeah. But I am, I'm a little biased now. I've given up on Matterport. I'm taking my losses to uncle Sam whenever they happen. And I think I'll make the money back up in my private investment in simpler space. So that's, you know, that's where I'm at. Cool. Well, I think you should give us a little update on uh, Simbler Space and the Patreon too. So this is a good time to bring up Patreon. As low as five dollars a month, you guys can sign up for Patreon. You can learn more. You would have seen us rant about Matterport for the last two years inside there, so people didn't have to hear it on the public podcast. Um, uh, there's lots <laughs> of other good stuff in there too. Sam's been on a health kick, other than drinking wine today. <laughs> and, um, I posted recently. I had some wins on uh, closed end funds from our friend Michael Foster, who we had on nice. last year. So I posted some of that information. Once again, that's exclusive just to Patreon. So if you want to check that out, it's always appreciated. If you own Matterport stock, tell us your strategy, put it in the boss lounge, put it on Patreon. I want to hear what you guys are thinking. I'm I'm going to scoop up a few more if it's under four bucks, Sam. I think it's just, it's going to bring my cost basis down. So why not? I'm not betting the farm on it, but I think it's fun to pay attention to this. And it just seems like... No one's talking about this. And it's a small enough company, as Colin brought up, that you know these big sharks aren't going to be looking at. So they just kind of view it as small bait. But this is a good chance for us retail investors to maybe take advantage of something here. All right. So Derek's on one side of the bet. I'm on the other side. We'll have some interesting conversations the next two months to, uh, to follow this trade. Awesome to learn about a new topic in merger arbitrage. Hope you bosses learned something alongside of us. And like Derek said, post what you're doing about Matterport or if you're involved in any other merger arbitrage opportunities, past or current. And I'll be shopping on Zillow or let's say homes.com on ways to spend my profits at the end of the summer, Sam. I will talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.